proseguiamo con, la quarta, con il quarto intervento di Stuart Grice della Hoover Strong. Eh, Stuart Grice ha più di 25 anni di esperienza lavorativa nel settore della gioielleria, in settori quali la progettazione di processo, l'assistenza tecnica e il controllo di produzione. È vicepresidente della divisione prodotti da lavorazione meccanica presso Hoover Strong Richmond in Virginia, Stati Uniti. Ha un higher diploma in fisica, un bachelor degree in uh, scienza di materiali e un master degree in metallurgia di materiali. È stato coautore del capitolo sui metalli preziosi dell'ASM International Metals Handbook on Metallurgy and Microstructures. Il titolo dell'intervento che Stuart ci presenterà è Oro artigianale ottenuto da fonti responsabili, un viaggio attraverso le comunità minerarie peruviane e colombiane. L'intervento si propone di spiegare i principi e gli obiettivi che sottendono l'approvvigionamento responsabile dei metalli artigianali e punta i riflettori sulla comunità, sulle comunità estrattive del Perù e della Colombia che aderiscono ai programmi di Fair Trade e Fair Mind. Verrà inoltre spiegato come aderire al progetto e quali sono i requisiti per diventare licenziatari Fair Trade e Fair Mind. Prego Stuart di avvicinarti. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon to you all. Um, thanks very much for taking the time to listen to what I've got to say. Um, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of responsibly sourced artisanal gold. Um, this isn't really a technical presentation. It's more of a sort of a National Geographic presentation, if you like. I hope you enjoy it. Um, so we'll get straight into it. So what is ASM, or artisanal and small-scale mining? Well, it's in the definition of the name. It's done by artisans or laborers, and it's on a very small scale compared to industrial mining. So they're relatively low-intensity mining operations. Um, mining methods, they can be hard rock, they can be alluvial, it doesn't matter. And in general, they're very low. Ah, oh. thank you. Is that better? In general, they are very low technology and very labor intensive operations, and mainly they are poverty driven activities. These communities are very, very marginalized. So, mining operations are informal, um, but they are definitely and tragically subject to a lot of criminal activity, which is a real problem. And these communities are usually excluded from the normal banking sector, and by that we mean they don't have access to lines of credit, to small-scale loans. Um, quite often, some of the mining operations don't even have a bank account, so they have little access to resources. And both Fair Mind and Fair Trade, their aim is to improve this. And they are not trying to replace industrially scaled mined gold at all. There's not enough ASM gold to do this. Uh, their aim is to improve the lives of the miners and the mining communities in the developing world. So these are the people that we are trying to help when we buy ASM. Um, some are loan operators, some miners collectives or cooperatives, some are relatively big concerns that um, have several hundred workers. Um, and I've stated that fair trade and fair mine are concerned with the developing world, and with that comes many problems with unregulated mining. And one of the major problems with unregulated mining is mercury. Now, if you are the same generation that I am, uh, when we had science class at high school, we used to flick mercury at each other across the desk. They allowed us to do that. Well, now we know mercury is highly toxic, but it's a very good material to use when you want to mine gold on this scale. You crush your ore into a sand-like consistency, you mix it in with some mercury with your hands or with your feet, as you can see here, um, and then you separate the amalgam and you burn off the mercury to leave the gold. And it's very, very simple. It is as simple as it sounds. Unfortunately, as I've said, it's very, very highly toxic. Not just the liquid mercury, the mercury fumes as well. Mercury poisoning damages your brain, your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, 
your immune system. It results in physical birth defects. Uh, children born to mothers with mercury poisoning uh, typically educationally subnormal and have decreased intelligence. And you end up with an entire toxicized ecosystem. So water life, plant life, fish, animals, all of it. And you die with exposure to mercury and you don't die very nicely. This is just a quick shot of a few of the less severe uh, birth defects that can occur. Uh, a lot of digit problems. There are a lot worse problems that take place than this. Um, but this is why we buy, or we want people to buy, certified ASM gold. It's to remove mercury from the process. So what do the mines need to do, first of all, to get certified? Well, you need to participate in the social development of your community. And nobody under the age of 15 is allowed to work at a certified mine, and nobody under the age of 18 is allowed to work in any hazardous conditions. Um, both fair trade and fair mind require mandatory use of protective gear and health and safety training for all employees. And yet that seems second nature to us here, but to this type of mining, it most definitely isn't. Mines have to recognise the right of employees to form or join trade unions to collectively negotiate their working conditions. And the use of mercury is definitely off. It's a no-no. Cyanide is quite often used, but it has to be done using responsible practices. And chemicals have to be reduced to a minimum and, wherever possible, eliminated over an agreed time period. So that's what mines, in a nutshell, have to do to comply with the standards to qualify for their premiums. And one of the questions a lot of people ask when we talk about ASM gold, fair mine gold, fair trade gold, uh, is why is it so expensive? Why does it cost so much? Where does the money go? What's that money used for? And these are all very, very, very fair questions because it's not cheap. You're paying considerably above market rate for this product. So they both use the same basic system. You agree a fixed percentage of the gold market, and that's monitored by the respective organisations so nobody cheats anybody else. And then you pay directly to the mine X dollars per kilo, so the mine can get a fair market value for what they're selling and get payment of a premium so that they can spend it on some of the things that they lack, which can be safety equipment, power, water, medical needs. So normally, we buy gold. We just... Gold, it's, it's in Italy, in the US, in the UK, etc. It's already in country. One of the reasons fair trade and fair mind is so expensive is because normally it isn't in country. You have to bring it in from the mining communities and in very small quantities. So you have transport and logistic costs uh, to get it from the mine to the airport and then you have to fly it to your destination country. Um, you have to insure it during transport. You have to pay a premium to the mine, as we've said. You have to pay a premium to fair trade or fair mind. So this starts to add up for the cost of the gold. On average, it's about 15% over spot price, but it can get as high as 20%, depending on the gold price and how much you bring in. And the premium is very important to the communities. So what they do is they generally put it into a fund or a kitty, and then when it reaches a certain amount, or after a certain amount of time, the mine owners and the managers decide what they're going to spend that money on. And typically, they're responsible in their choices, and they consult their communities before spending the money and deciding what to do with it. So in the case of one of the mines that I'm going to talk about very briefly, um, they decided the money would be best spent on wiring the town up to the mains electricity, to the main grid. So that's what they did. And then the year after that, they decided to go with the cell phone tower, uh, which may sound a bit strange, but many of the miners don't live permanently at the mine. They live there for three weeks stints. And so communication with home and family is very, very important, hence the cell phone tower. Um, the same mine, the next thing they decided to spend their money on was a football pitch. Um, this is Satrami in Peru. They built a plateau out of waste rock from the mine, and then they had a football pitch built on it. And for them, this is an extremely good spend. Um, the workers have a sporting activity, so they can do it for fitness and entertainment. They have their own league. They involve other mines and other communities, so it's an all-round good spend. 
When we look at Peru and Colombia, Colombia mining doesn't really account for a lot of their GDP. They're an oil and a white goods country. But for Peru, about 15% of their GDP is from on-the-books mining. Of course, they have no idea how much off-the-books mining uh, or unregulated mining there is because it's off the books. But the government wants to uh, regulate as much mining as it can because it wants to grow the tax base to increase the economy of the comp country and it wants to regulate these mines for their health and safety so that their workers have good working conditions and it wants to try and prevent all the crime and exploitation that takes place. And as an incentive, they offer a 5% tax refund and every kilo of gold from Peru that a mine will export. The tax base obviously is used for um, medical care, education, roads, just as it is in other countries. And unregulated miners do often die due to their working conditions. Um, so they're taken advantage of in many ways. So if we look at an unregulated mine, where's my pointer? So this is sort of a, this is a, a, a mountain in the Atacama Desert in Peru where we went and it's quite imposing, it's quite a big mountain. And if we move a little further along that mountain, we can see, if you can see that little black dot on the top there, that is an unregulated mine. And that'll be a shack covering a hole in the ground. There'll be just a few miners working it. Um, but everything they need has to be taken up that mountain, either by hand or they load it onto donkeys or mules. So. Supplies such as food and water, their tools and equipment, wood if they want to shore up their tunnels, uh, mercury to process the ore on site because they don't want to carry the ore down the mountain. There is no safety regulations that go on and many of these miners do in fact uh, die. Mortality rate is very high. Um, tunnels go unsupported because they have to get the wood from the coastal areas into the general area to start off with. That's 50, 60, 70, kil 70 kilometers away. Um, so quite often they don't bother. They get tunnel collapses uh, with the inevitable results. Problems with mercury poisoning amongst these people are also very, very high. It's a tough life doing this, hence trying to make it better. So. One of the mines that we uh, visited in Peru was called McDaza, and it was originally basically a hole in the ground, like most mines in the region. Um, they were all left idle when Spain uh, left Peru in the 1820s. So relatively recently, people started resuming their mining operations, and the area was what you would describe as the Wild West. Different mining operations were very much fighting with each other. Um, but miners were barely making a living. Uh, safety was non-existent and life was very hard. So at McDaza, there were about 350 miners that agreed that the only way to improve their lot and the lot of their families was to work together. So at this point in time, miners were using hand tools and wheelbarrows to move the ore from the mine outside. So they carried sort of 50, 60 kilo bags to their donkeys. They then walked the donkeys 50 kilometers down the mountainside to the processing plant, where at best they were given 80% of market value for the gold they had, but the scales were rigged, the assays were rigged, and the ore was processed incorrectly. So on average, they ended up getting paid for about half of what they actually mined. So they decided they needed to start processing the ore themselves. So they started with mercury, but they didn't know what they were doing. So they determined that they needed to invest in their own technology and hire people who knew what they were doing. If you'll excuse me, a bit of dry mouth syndrome. So these original 350 miners, they took out just enough money to live by. This is a part of MacDaza town, so this just gives you an idea of, of how these mining communities live. These are people's houses, so they're typically one room, uh, maybe two rooms, um, very small, and depending on how much money you've got, they're made out of three millimeter thick plywood or six millimeter thick plywood, but they're basically a shed, a shack, and, and these are quite desirable. Some people live in homes that are actually just made out of matting. So what did they do to uh, improve their lot? Well, the first thing they purchased was proper mining drills so they didn't have to use hammers and chisels. Uh, they made rock and dirt roads. 
to get the trucks up and down to the mine. They improved housing for the workers and they invested in safety equipment and safety training, very typical of what these mines do. Uh, they improved conditions in the mine, so they started pumping air in the mine, because if you don't do that, you start getting pulmonary conditions, lung conditions. They made the mines themselves safe by shoring up the walls and the ceilings. They put in rail tracks so they can move the ore around in little trucks. They did their own assaying on site, so they knew how, exactly how much gold they got, and they developed processes to become mercury-free. The current output at McDaser uh, is about 140 tonnes of rock a day. The target was 250 tonnes, and I believe they just opened up a fourth tunnel, so they're probably doing that now. Their yield, at the time I went two years ago, was about 8 grams per tonne. So they produce about 25 kilos of gold a month, which is not big industrial scale, but artisanal scale, that's quite big. They employ 600 people working three shifts, 11 hour days, eight hours of those days have to be worked directly. Um, they work 20 days on, 10 days off, and the 10 days off is unpaid. But for mining employees while they are working at the mine, or their housing, their food, their medical and education is paid for by the mine because the mine wants to attract the best people it possibly can. Are we going forward? Yes. Same story at uh, Santa Filomena, which is where the Satrami mine is. The village of Santa Filomena that you can see in the picture here, it grew up around uh, the mine. It's about 9,200 feet up, so I suppose that's about 3,000 meters. Um, and they work shifts similar to those at McDaser. They have a population in the village of about 2,000. 700 work directly for the mine, 160 work the face and they formed their mine 31 years ago. Um, and just like Mac Dazer, all the profits, they were invested back into the mine and the community. And if you can see, there's our cell phone tower. That's very important. Um, it's very mountainous terrain. Um, and where the mine is, actually, is sort of right at the top of this mountain up there. So this is typically the roads that you travel to get to the mines. It was a four hour drive, at least a four hour drive, but they actually built 40 kilometers of asphalt metal road. So that cut it down to two hours. Um, you can see here a supply truck, this, this blue truck here, everything has to be taken up the mountain, even their water, because there's nothing up there. Um, it's the driest place on earth. As I said, it's the Atacami Desert. Satrami, the village itself, has no running water. So they have no flushing toilets, no running taps. All water has to be transported up the mountain in trucks. So three trucks drive three times a day each up the mountain, taking them all the water they need. Uh, so Trami processes about 2,400 tons of ore a month, which is a little less than McDaser, but their vein is a lot richer. They get about 25 grams a ton. So they produce about 60 kilos a month. All the waste rock is used to create flat areas that they extend the town and the mine buildings on, so nothing goes to waste. Um, rather than just discarding it, they use it very sensibly. Whoops, wrong way, back. So yeah, so this is all sort of tailings that have come out the mine that they've processed and have been finished. So they use everything. I say McDays has now got four tunnels. Satrami only has one. This is the tunnel. This is what presents every miner as he goes down to work every day. And this is just the top of the tunnel leading down into the mine. To give you a bit of scale, Alan here, he's about six foot. Monica, she's probably five foot. So that gives you an idea of the scale. Every miner goes down this shaft every day. It's 630 meters deep. They have 13 mining levels, and it takes the miners about 35 minutes every morning, every shift to go down the mine to the work face, and then it takes them about 45 minutes to climb back up out of the work face. And that's outside of their eight hours of direct work. And if you are in any way claustrophobic, trust me, it's not anywhere you would like to go. Um, inside the mine itself, it's fairly safe. Um, I've got myself here just to give you a bit of scale, of what it's like. Um, logs are used to short up the roof, but generally there isn't any lighting. They only have lighting at the work face and at the ore extraction rails. Um, you have to wear hard hats, obviously, and you must wear respirators. The dust is a constant, and the dust is very much like cement dust. 
So it causes very serious lung problems if you continually expose yourself to it. So respirators are a must. For processing the ore, um, all the mines use very much the same sort of process. They originally used mercury, but they understood how toxic it was, so they looked for alternatives. And you, what they do is they crush the ore, first of all, and they put it into uh, big steel tumbling barrels with steel shot, and they barrel it with water till it makes a slurry with the sort of consistency of sand, and then they pump it from the barrel into these cyanide tanks. These are enclosed cyanide tanks here. That sort of railing gives you the sort of size of uh, what it is. So the slurry is pumped into the cyanide tanks and the gold becomes suspended into solution. And then the solution is put through these tanks. Next, there's three of them. And their gold attaches itself to small carbon particles, which are about the size of a, grace of, a grain of rice. Um, it goes through three tanks for them to get maximum yield. And they yield about 98% of the gold they come out. So it's a pretty efficient process for them. Once they've finished here, the waste cyanide is disposed of. So this here is a cyanide waste pool. And it's not to be confused with the extremely environmentally damaging process of cyanide leaching. This is not cyanide leaching. Uh, this process is confined to tanks. And then once they've finished, the waste cyanide is transferred to these pools with these very, very, very durable membranes in them. Um, the waste is chemically treated so that when it's exposed to ultraviolet light, and there's a lot of it up there, uh, it becomes non-toxic. When they get full, they fill them over, they cover them, and then they build on them or they plant them. Where I took this picture from, I'm actually standing on top of a filled-in cyanide waste pool. Um, it's not ideal, but it's much, much, much better than mercury, and it's extremely well managed. So following on with the process, these carbon grains with the gold attached to them are transferred to an electrolytic cell. And then by a process of electrolysis, the gold is precipitated onto steel wool electrodes, which are then put in a furnace such as this here. And the gold is melted off into their resultant dore bars. So that's a brief description. It's a very simple process and it works very, very well. The mines spend a lot of their money from fair trade and fair mine activities um, on their schools, and particularly their kindergarten and their elementary schools. Um, they're nice, very clean, permanent block buildings. Um, they're fenced in, they're lighted, and they do have uh, a lot of computer technology in there because they teach the children from a very early age how to use computers, how to use the internet. Again, things we take for granted that they don't have. And then once the kids leave school, they bring the adults in, and the adults use the same computers to learn internet and uh, computing as well. And this, again, is very important to them. Uh, they use their premium money very wisely, and they want their children to have better lives and better opportunities than they had. So this is a, a big deal for them. This is also an important place, not just for the mine, but very much for the entire surrounding community. And this is their medical center. Um, the mine funds this, but they actually let anybody use it. They see it as their community service to do so. It's quite well equipped. They have their own ambulance. And when I was there a couple of years ago, um, the next thing on the list they wanted was an x-ray machine. Um, so they didn't have to transport people 70 kilometers down the mountain to a nearest hospital to get an x-ray. So uh, overall, these guys in Peru are a success story. And they try to spread the word to informal, informal miners about how you can be a success story by coming under fair trade and fair mind uh, licensure. So the same is true for the Colombian mines. And we'll briefly just look at the Colombian mines. Um, they're on a much smaller scale than the Peruvian mines. They have the same problems. But until recently, Colombia was a much more dangerous place uh, than it is right now. Uh, there's still a great deal of illegal mining, um, and the government wants to regulate it, but unfortunately they're not that good at doing it at the moment. Their implementation has seen many problems, and one of their problems is they go to these communities that are not, all the community can do is mine, and they tell them you can't mine anymore, but they don't give them an alternative. So to live, to put food on the table, the communities have to go back to illegal mining. And again, a lot of crime involved, a lot of extortion, 
Um, so it's not a great situation. And Colombia does have a formal ban on mercury, but again, they find it very difficult to enforce. So this is the Akira Cooperative that we went to. This is uh, probably three, four hours southwest of Bogota. Um, it was founded in 2004 by 11 shareholders. And in 2010, they were up to 35 co-op shareholders, and eight of those were women. Um, and they have 11 legally registered mines. And initially, they would sell to the local market informally. But when they became fair mind, it gave them a, a huge advantage, and that was they could export. So each mine is its own entity, but they co-op for banking, selling, and exporting purposes to get better deals and to get reduced costs. And it works very well for them. Inside the mine, it's very different from the Peruvian mines. It's very, very wet in the tunnels. But they don't mind because they say where there's water, there is gold. Because in this area, uh, rainwater runs through the soil, through the earth, and through the permeable rock, and hits quartz layers, which are impermeable. And it runs through the quartz layer, and then drops out. And the quartz layer is where the gold is. So they say where there's water, there's gold. Each mine has its own gas detection system so that it protects the workers in case they have any gas escapes. Um, they have safe rooms in case of gas leaks or collapses. They have oxygen in there, first aid kits, bit of food, etc. All mines and processing plants have first aid kits and have personal protective equipment for their workers, which again we take for advantage. But in these communities, it's not the norm at all to do so. Um, they employ women to handle the explosives, which I thought was very, very good. And when I asked them why they do that, they said because they have less bravado and more finesse for some reason. So the women do all the blasting. Um, they process their ore much as the same way in Peru, by Sinai, but on a much more smaller scale. Um, these bags here, as I say, each bag contains about 50 kilos of ore, and that has about two grams in each bag. So they'll crush that up and they use flotation tables to separate out the heavy gold-rich particles from the rest. And they don't use carbon rice, they use settlement tanks um, to let the gold-rich particles separate out by gravity. Um, we also visited mines in the Narino district, which is right by the Colombian border. Um, and again, the mine is right at the top of these hills here. It's about 9,000-something feet up. Again, about 3,000 meters. Um, and it was quite an adventurous ride to get there. Um, this is a mine called Kudmia Mine. Uh, it's typical of the mines in the area. Um, small scale. You're up in the clouds. Um, but the mine is the principal activity of the town there. All the town depends on is the mine. So the mine is very, very important to the community. And it has four titles. And they've been going for about 40 years, and they have 100 hectares of land, but actually they only use two or three at the moment, so they have plenty in reserve. This is their second mine that's been fair mine certified, and three miners work it, just three miners. And as you can see, it's very, very wet, very, very damp inside. Um, they run their mine as a cooperative, and they run it as a non-profit. So uh, all of the profits are pushed back into the town and the community to make everybody's standard of living uh, much better. Coo Miller is actually out of certification at the moment. Unfortunately, the Colombian government has decided to change the banking laws to prevent money laundering and anti-terrorism um, efforts, but it's made it very difficult for the small mines to get banking export licenses. So Fairmind and Fairtrade are working on that at the moment. This is just inside the mine. This is where they have their lunch. This is the break area where they have their first aid kit. So this is where they sit at lunchtime in the mine. Just thought that was worth putting in. And here is the vein. This is quartz vein. This is what they're looking for. This is where the gold is. So they blast that out. And finally, this is what they, place they call Guarconda mine. Um, it's built into the jungle. It's built on the natural slope of the jungle. So it aids them in their processing. Down here, these blue tanks here, these are their cyanide tanks they use. So they use the natural slope for their process. Um, Gualconda, again, is undergoing problems because of the new banking laws. 
They also use a flotation table to separate their gold. And then at the bottom here, you can see one of the miners. These are the settlement tanks uh, down here. And he's just panning the gold. And you can see uh, a little bit of it there coming out in his pan. But this will all go into their cyanide process. They produce about a kilo a month. That's all they produce at this mine. There are 12 people who work it. They're generally a family. Um, and they're also a member of a co-op. So it's very, very small scale. And just to give you some idea of the remoteness of this, if you look a little further in here, there's a little dark spot. And that's another mine entrance. And there's another one there. So you can see it's quite remote to get any equipment, any supplies, any working uh, down to the mines themselves. Most of the mining area looks like the picture on the left. Um, however, the picture on the right is where they used to mine with the mercury. So this is what uh, um, the mercury uh, contamination looks like in the mine area. And the mine owner, Roberto, this was in his father's time, he used to use mercury. Um, and this is right around the corner from where I took the photograph uh, on the left. Um, you can see... If you look carefully, there's the remains of a water wheel here they used to use. And they used to take their processed mercury and just flush it right into the stream. And so it would flow down the stream and contaminate the wildlife, the environment in the area. So when Roberto took over the mine, he decided to stop this. And they don't hide this. They are very proud of what they've done with their mine. So they show it to you so that uh, in no small parts, you can see how far they've come. So to wind all this up, why should you do this? Well, it can be a good way to get customers into your store. Um, you don't need to go fully fair mind or fair trade at all. You can do a line or a collection or a piece. Um, it's very attractive, from, so I'm told, to millennials, etc. Some millennials might disagree me with that. I don't know. But it's good karma. I mean, this is about giving back. Um, every bit helps. There's absolutely no obligation to go full fair trade or fair mind, but the story is there, where it comes from, what the extra money does. It gives people a reason to buy this, uh, and knowing that their purchase uh, makes a difference. And how can you get the gold? Well, you contract fair trade or fair mind, and they provide you with a list of suppliers. There's a gentleman in the audience, Francesco Bologna, who's just about to become Italy's first Fairmine first authorised buyer, so here's where you can get it from if you want to. They both work a very similar system. If you want to use the mark Fairtrade or Fairmind, you have to be licensed. And depending on the volume of business you do, you may have to pay. Um, you may have to undergo an audit. And you need to pay an organisation or fee for every gram you sell. But if you don't want to use the name or the mark, you don't have to. You can still buy the gold and use it. There are no limits to anybody using this gold. You just have to call it Paulo's Artisanal Gold or something like that. You, just, you can't use the fair trade or the fair mine names without being a licensee. And how do you sell it? I'm no salesman, but we do tell people if you buy it, don't mark up the fair trade or the fair mine premium. Ask your supplier what the cost of the gold would buy if it was not fair trade or mined or fair mined. Do all your markups and calculations and only add the fair trade premium in and the fair mine premium at the end so that we make it as attractive as possible to customers because we want to sell as much of this as we can to help as many of these communities as we can. And so finally, where you source your gold from is a personal choice. Um, you can go 100% recycled, which is very popular. Um, this source of gold you can say has already paid its environmental price. And by choosing this option, you're getting a very responsible gold supply. You can go with responsibly mined industrial scale, or like we pointed out here, with responsibly mined ASM gold. Um, there's an audit trail with these, and you know where the gold's coming from, and you can inform your customers of this. Or you can decide not to take part at all. It's entirely up to you. It's your choice. Being responsible can be good for business, and we have to remember that all gold at some point has been mined. Um, and the overall aim should be, within our industry, to remove irresponsible gold mining. Uh, traceability from mine or recycler to retailer is very, very important, and there's still a great need for both industry and consumer education on this subject. 
So the final thing I'd like to say is, if you, where you live, where you work, if you had a company that set up in your town and dumped their waste into a river or a stream by you and polluted it, causing environmental damage, would you still buy products from that company or would you not? Would you boycott them? And if the answer is no, you wouldn't, then why should we treat gold any differently? Just because it's not happening where you are doesn't mean it's not happening somewhere else. Double negative. That was bad. So, yeah. It doesn't change the fact that it's still happening. And I often get asked the question, is ASM gold any different from other gold? Well, yeah. I mean, gold is gold is absolutely correct. It isn't any different physically. The difference is where it comes from, what environmental price and social price it's paid, and how you get it. So with that, I think I've run over a teeny-weeny little bit, but thank you very much.